Welcome to the region's Economic and Markets Roundtable discussion. I'm Jeremy Keene, joined by Chris Scribner, Public Policy Manager of Regions Government Affairs. We're also joined by Regions Chief Economist Richard Moody and Chief Investment Officer Alan McKnight. In this podcast, we'll address some of the latest issues affecting investments, including the political climate, and we hope you'll come away with insights that can help you make more informed financial decisions. Before we get to the heart of the discussion, our legal and compliance groups have asked us to highlight disclosure information, and that is trust and investment management services are offered through Regions Wealth Management, which is a business group of Regions Bank. The opinions expressed in this roundtable discussion are those of the presenters and not necessarily of Regions Financial Corporation or any of its subsidiaries, and the opinions may change. First, I want to turn to Chris Scribner, who's joining us on the line from Washington, D.C. Chris, looking back on 2017, how would you assess the work of the Trump administration in terms of its economic agenda, tax reform, plans to change health care and the budget, compared to expectations when the administration took office? Well, clearly, with the passage of the tax bill, you know, the Trump administration got a big legislative win and a signature, you know, achievement, which will take years to probably to understand, you know, what, it, what its implications mean. But that, that was a big moment, you know, given that there had been a failure to pass major legislation with the Republicans in charge of the House, the Senate, and controlling the presidency. Stepping you know, back from that issue for a second, I mean, clearly in 2017, you know, there was never a kind of pivot to the kind of normal presidency, and the style and communication style of the president really is also a significant departure sometimes masking what have been, you know, real policy changes that that have been made. And uh, most of those have to do with the activities in the regulatory agencies and within the executive branch agencies, where clearly the pace of rulemaking has slowed. Some rules which were about to be released at at the tail end of the Obama administration were never released uh, or made final in, in 2017. Um, and some rules were repealed by by Congress using their legislative authority. So, you know, on the campaign uh, promise of rolling back regulation, that's something where there has been some some you know significant progress, and more probably to come. You know, one of the things that was noted too, or has been noted, is the president has only appointed about a, one third of the agency officials that he can do, and some of that's you know clearly intentional to slow down the pace of activity um, of government. One place that he has been uh, aggressive in making appointments is to the courts, and I think with the you know uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch in the Supreme Court and many more federal judges nominated and, and on the bench and in queue to be have their nominations approved, that's a significant, you know, long term impact on um, you know, frankly, the way regulations and legislation will be will be reviewed by the courts. So, you know, coupling that with the tax bill, there's been some, you know, significant achievements uh, in twenty seventeen, even with health care or the attempt to repeal Obamacare failing. And Chris, in your view, why was tax reform successful when replacing the Affordable Care Act was not, or at least hasn't been so far? Well, I should I should note and underline that the uh, tax bill did include a repeal of the individual mandate. So there was, through that legislation, a significant change to Obamacare policy that will have impacts on the health care markets in the states, and we'll see what the impact will be ultimately on Obamacare itself. But... Thinking about the differences between the two bills, while both were simple ideologically for Republicans, it was changing the health care policy was much more complex, and that complexity uh, cost the Republicans several votes in the Senate, which ultimately was the margin of defeat for the bill. You know, again, both were done under you know, reconciliation rules, which only required a simple majority vote in the Senate and no need to engage the Democrats. You know, tax cuts were successful in part because the Republican brand was or is uh, reducing the tax burden. And there was a, a political imperative that Republican members felt, even those who questioned some aspects of the tax reform legislation, that they needed to prove that they could pass a significant bill and govern. And so they had an eye toward 2018 when passing this legislation, as well as achieving you know, what they thought was the correct uh, public policy ends. 
Thank you, Chris. And I want to turn to Regents Chief Economist Richard Moody. Richard, based on the data available at this point, it looks like real GDP growth for 2017 will be around 2.2%, which is pretty much what we've seen over the life of this expansion. Yet you've consistently noted the economy built up a considerable degree of positive momentum over the second half of last year. So as we head into this new year, do you see this as being a more of the same year? Or is this a, this year is really different time for the economy? I think it's gonna be more of a, this year is really different year for the economy. We look for real GDP growth of around 2.7%, which would be significantly above what we've seen over most of this expansion. Um, the economy did finish 2017 on a strong note. Consumer spending was very strong in Q4. Business investment was very strong over the second half of 2017, and that, that momentum should carry into 2018. Another thing that will help the U.S. this year is we are, for the first time in more than a decade, seeing synchronized global economic growth. So that will help support U.S. exports. So we, we look for a better year this year. The labor market is still strong. Household balance sheets are in very good condition, so that will support consumer spending in this year. But consumers will be carrying less of the load this year, given the, the better business investment outlook we're, we're expecting. So it's not going to be the 3% the growth a lot of people are expecting for, a lot of people are forecasting, but it'll be closer than we've been in some time. All right, Richard, and Alan McKnight, Chief Investment Officer of Regions Asset Management, what's your take on the U.S. economy? And given the run of the stock market over this past year and now the tax legislation that came out of Washington, how does the firm position itself going into 2018? As Richard noted, we are positive on both the economy and the markets going into 2018. We feel that the key ingredients for continued success in the markets will be fueled by both tax changes as well as the lower regulations that both Richard and Chris have alluded to. With those two factors in mind, we think that operating earnings could improve in the S&P 500, and we believe that the stock market will follow suit. We saw a nice double-digit gain in earnings last year, and that fueled an over 20% return in the S&P 500. We think we could see a similar type of year in terms of operating earnings. We don't believe it will be quite as robust from an earnings perspective translation effect into market returns, but we still see very positive uh, news coming out of the stock market. And really from a challenge perspective, we see that more in fixed income land, where bonds will continue to be challenged by higher rates and a continued push by the Federal Reserve in raising rates. Richard, does the federal tax overhaul cause you to change your baseline forecast? And if so, how? It did. Um, it added about 25 basis points to our forecast for real GDP growth in 2018 and about 15 basis points to our forecast for 2019. Now, most of the effects that we capture in our forecasting model come from the, the corporate side, particularly business investment spending will be stronger in the wake of the tax bill than we had anticipated before. Um, and to a point Chris made earlier, there's a lot less clarity on the individual side of the ledger. You know, when you think about the changes in individual taxes, you have lower rates but fewer deductions, um, and then you have a larger personal exemption. And really, it's gonna affect different households differently. It's gonna affect different parts of the country differently. So it's much harder to get a take on how the household side of the economy is gonna fare in the wake of the tax bill. And like Chris said, that's probably gonna take a few years to figure out. But the more immediate effect we expect is to see even stronger business investment in 2018 than we saw in 2017. And turning back to Chris, uh, Chris, in an interview with the New York Times, President Trump suggested he might work more with Democrats in 2018. Is this a likely scenario in your view? And what are the key issues for 2018? And could we see an infrastructure deal among those issues? Well, there are, there are two parts to that question. In the short term, we're going to see if the president can work with Democrats, and, and in fact, we'll have to on some issues because the, the Congress needs to agree to uh, a plan to fund the government past uh, January 19th. And then how broad that agreement might be doesn't include policy changes or reauthorizations of children's health insurance program, uh, of the flood insurance program, of uh, immigration does it include a border wall? And there are some significant policy issues that could you know, undermine those discussions. We don't believe the government will, will shut, but 
how broad that discussion is will indicate whether or not the president is willing to work with, can work with, have, well, or will have a willing partner with Democrats, who he will need to work with if there is significant legislation in 2018. The biggest question is whether there will be an infrastructure package. We're actually fairly bearish on the, the possibility of there being a, a large bipartisan infrastructure deal. And we haven't really seen in tax reform and health care underlined it, a willingness of congressional Republicans to work with their Democratic counterparts. And Alan, against this backdrop and taking more of a markets-based uh, approach, looking at stellar performance by equities, but lackluster performance by fixed income back in 2017, do you envision that same market landscape in 2018? And based on your outlook, which asset classes and sectors do you see as benefiting in this year? We actually see more of the same in 2018, specifically within fixed income. We think it's gonna be a challenging market environment for bonds across the continuum, everything from short duration out to long duration. We see the curve actually moving higher and more limited opportunities in uh, more of the credit regime. But bottom line, we think it's gonna be a challenge in bonds. Now, pivoting to equities, we look at it on a global scale. And to Richard's great point earlier, we see the global economy improving, not just the U.S. And what we have been doing over the last couple of months is repositioning into international markets, adding more in international developed and emerging market equities. We see that in playing catch up. And it's one of the key themes for us in 2018 is international markets finally starting to return and generate returns similar to their domestic peers who've really been the and enjoyed the lion's share of improvement since the crisis of 2008. So the big themes for us would be twofold in the equity markets and in fixed income. And it's one, shifting in international and two, lowering exposure to bond when possible. Transitioning over to sectors that we think are interesting, if you're looking within your domestic portfolio, we're looking favorably upon energy, consumer discretionary and financials. We think those are all areas that can improve in an improving economy. Energy as oil prices have stabilized, the consumer as more money is passed to their wallets and financials with the lower regulations that Chris has alluded to in the opportunity set for financial services companies to benefit from a rising rate environment. So we see those three sectors as improving in the coming year within domestic equity portfolios. Richard, the current expansion is now in its ninth year. It's soon going to become the second longest expansion on record. In light of this, should we be worried that the end of the expansion can't be far away? I don't think so. Expansions don't die of old age. And what I always tell people is that this expansion may be old, but it hasn't done a lot of living. I mean, what I mean by that is for being in its ninth year, this expansion is remarkably free of a lot of the excesses that tend to build up over the course of expansions, you know, which you see when the economy grows at a faster rate than it has over the course of this expansion. So therefore, that the Fed has the latitude to follow a gradual course of rate hikes. There's still some slack in the domestic economy. There's an even greater degree of slack in the global economy which should hold down inflation pressures for most of this year. Um, so just the, the fact that the expansion is old is not a reason to worry that it's going to end soon, given that we are pretty much free of the excesses that you would have seen in past cycles. If not its age, though, are there other risks that you see to the expansion continuing through 2018? Sure, we, we do see some downside risks. And first and foremost, unfortunately, I, I think you always have to include geopolitical tensions. You know, the, the world seems uh, an unsettled place as we enter into 2018. There are a number of hot spots around the globe that could erupt into something bigger. And even if you can't quantify the effects or put probability on, on the outcomes, you can't underestimate the financial and psychological toll that some of these events could exact on the economy and the financial markets were they to occur. Um, now more strictly towards the economics, inflation was fairly tame over the course of 2017, and there are actually people who think inflation is dead. Well, what I would say is there's a difference between inflation being dormant and inflation being dead, and I think it would be unwise to totally discount the risks that inflation surprises to the upside this year. And were that to happen, the Fed would go at a faster rate in terms of raising the, the Fed funds rate than they're anticipating now, and more importantly, faster rate than financial market participants 
are anticipating right now. So that could have disruptive effects on the economy and the markets. And if rates rise too quickly within too short of a time, it could certainly sow the, the seeds of the end of this expansion. So those really are the, the two biggest downside risks that, that we are worrying about right now. Alan, the Fed is facing its biggest leadership overhaul since 1936 with the appointing of a new Fed chair and several new members. Can you discuss market expectations and implications over the near term and the long term? Well, we think that Richard did a great job of outlining the challenge from a policy perspective, and it's one of the key risks that we see within the markets this year, not on the economic front, but really as a market reaction. How did the markets and the bond market specifically react to the possibility of higher inflation? the possibility that the Fed decides to become more hawkish, they decide that they are actually going to raise rates at a faster clip than anticipated by the market. That's the situation where you could then see a real challenge in equity markets and bonds selling off in pretty short order as short duration bonds start to really move higher in yield and really with the risk of a possible inverted yield curve down the road. So we don't envision that happening this year, but that's something that we watch very closely and we're concerned based on the transition in leadership and how they will react to the data. We are of the belief that they don't have a real rational response to say they wanted to move faster than what they've already articulated. That doesn't benefit them to go out and get over their skis. But we do also know that if the data starts coming in and inflation is higher than anticipated, and we do start to see unemployment continue to come down, wage pressures, and other items that Richard had noted, they may feel compelled to do that. And that would be a real challenge for the bond market. Similarly, the equity markets are now in a mode of focus on the fiscal and don't worry so much about monetary. If monetary was suddenly to get focus again, that could be of concern as well because the markets and the stock market specifically may be concerned that the Fed challenges any opportunities that the most recent tax regulation and cuts would do to benefit earnings. Finally, from a Fed perspective, you have to look more globally and some of the transition that is going on from a, an ECB perspective, as well as the Japanese central bank. And we are always watching that to understand how quickly do they pull back. Um, the ECB specifically has been speaking to pairing back their quantitative easing program. What could the implications be to Europe? Um, Europe is finally on firm footing now. We feel like they have an opportunity to start growing again and at a faster rate. But without the support of the ECB, that could be problematic. So that's another area that we're watching closely with the hope that in both cases, they will be mindful of that and they will keep a gradual process in place. Richard, regarding your expectations for the FOMC this year, how many times do you think the committee will raise the federal funds rate and what is your broader outlook on the path of market interest rates? Our baseline forecast incorporates three 25 basis point hikes in the Fed funds rate this year, which is what the Fed delivered last year. It's also consistent with the projections the FOMC gave us in December of three rate hikes this year. Um, but to Alan's point, there's going to be a lot of turnover on the FOMC this year. And another thing to, to factor into the equation is the rotation of voting amongst the regional Fed presidents is going to result in a slightly more hawkish composition this year relative to the, the regional presidents who rolled off at the end of last year. So there is a possibility that when the new appointees come on board and you factor in the new voting bloc, then the FOMC could be more aggressive than market participants are anticipating. And right now, market-based measures of the path of the funds rate are pricing in fewer than three rate hikes this year. So there could be considerable volatility if market participants get caught off guard by the Fed moving faster than people are now anticipating. And consistent with the path of the Fed funds rate that we see in our baseline forecast, longer term rates would be gradually higher over the course of this year as well. Now, over the last few years, um, long-term rates have made fools of those of us who keep forecasting they're going to be going up over the course of the year. So again, in the theme of this year, it really will be different, then that would suggest market interest rates would trend higher over the course of this year. And again, I think the biggest risk here is that inflation and therefore the Fed move faster than people are now anticipating, which would mean longer-term rates could rise even more than we're anticipating at this point.
Alan, based on history, the equity markets look to be overdue for a correction. The S&P 500 hasn't fallen by over 5% since June of 2016, back after Brexit. It hasn't fallen by 10% or more since earlier that same year. What potential catalysts do you see on the horizon for a sell-off, and what can investors do to position their portfolios for such an eventuality? Well, as we look at markets, we always think that history is a great guide. It's not necessarily an accurate indicator of the short run, but certainly over the long run, it's, it's fairly good at discerning where the markets will go. And if you look back over time, you should expect a 10% correction every year, going back to 1900, and a 5% correction every uh, three times a year. So as we look at the markets going into 2018, we haven't had any type of real correction in so long we think that it's almost due at a certain point. Now, the challenge being that we don't see a lot of reasons or themes or catalysts that would cause that correction. So the three key catalysts that we see that could precipitate a, a downturn, a correction of some sort, really would be one, the central bank policy missteps. As we've discussed before, we think if the Fed was to get it wrong or the ECB and we see a real transition in terms of policy, that would be an issue. Two geopolitical unrest, items such as North Korea, that's very hard to bake into your numbers or assumptions or forecasts, but the reality is something, some exogenous fact along those lines where countries are going to war and or there are political changes in regimes, that certainly would be a catalyst for a correction. And then finally, investor sentiment and consumer leverage. So investor sentiment has been incredibly high. People feel quite good. Um, the best analogy I would have is, is something I saw recently on CNBC where there was a infomercial for um, a bacon bowl. Everything tastes better in bacon. And the reason that's so critical for me and why I think it's so interesting is that there's such a huge risk appetite out there. All things are good. More of it is even better. Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin was up over 1,300% last year. All risk assets, whether it be emerging market equities, domestic equities, international developed, everything had multi-double digit returns. And in that type of market environment, everything has to work perfectly. So we look at it as an opportunity to a certain extent when we finally do get that correction, when finally the market says, maybe my appetite's not quite that large. We see that as an opportunity to rebuild positions and some of the risk assets and allow the market to reset, if you will, back to a baseline before moving higher. All right. Thanks, Alan. And let's turn once again to Chris Scribner in Washington. Uh, Chris, as of early January, how do you see the political landscape evolving as we head through a midterm election year? And second, do you have a prediction on the likelihood that Republicans maintain their majorities in Congress? I think observers have underestimated the policy impacts of the first year of the Trump administration, as, as I mentioned before. But I do think it's hard to overestimate how unpopular the president is and the impact that that will have on the elections later this year. Um, and looking back at history and using, you know, recent history as a guide, we've seen Democrats, even when they, whether they win or lose special elections, certainly outperforming in a, by a significant margin their, their norm in the, in the past elections. So both the House and Senate are in play. And uh, I've had to revise my comments that the House wouldn't be in play for another decade. The Democrats have a, very much an uphill battle to gain control of the House and the Senate, but both are possible. I do think as it plays out in terms of 2018 policymaking, both parties will be cautious. And we, as I mentioned before, we don't expect too much legislative activity as a, as a result. Finally, it's worth noting that whether or not the Democrats do take control of either the House or the Senate, or indeed if they take control of both, we won't see significant policy shifts in the short term only because there's the ability to veto legislation. Um, that will be a you know, a change that, a significant change we wouldn't see until after the next presidential election in 2020. Chris, do you see any further implications that people would be likely to see if indeed a switch happens as far as control of Congress? The most obvious change if the Democrats gain control of either chamber is the ramping up of the investigative efforts into, um, you know, into the president's activities or the campaign activities. But from a policymaking perspective, they'll have little ability to change the tax bill or the pace of regulation in the executive branch or regulatory agencies. So, again, not a significant policy shift. 
All right, Chris, Alan, and Richard, thank you very much. And to our listeners, we thank you for taking the time to check out this podcast. If you'd like to discuss your own investments and positioning for the future, we invite you to complete a Regions Wealth Management contact form on regions.com or call 1-800-REGIONS and a Regions Wealth Advisor will be in touch. I'm Jeremy King. We'll see you later this year for another Economic and Market Roundtable from Regions.